very, very interesting, renowned, notorious French artist of the 19th century and lived into the 20th century, actually. He died in 1901. Died in 1901. He just barely made it in the 20th uh, century. Uh, Julia, uh, I've been going through the book and reading your uh, biography. You have a very interesting background uh, in the arts and in literature. Uh, would you like to tell us about yourself, and then we'll get into why you wrote the book and all about the book. Well, I uh, was not trained to be a writer. I, in fact, was trained to be a painter and studied painting and printmaking as an undergraduate and then went to graduate school in French literature because my father thought I probably would starve to death if I was a painter. And uh, I'm now employed as a professor of French literature at the University of Colorado. But writing about an artist obviously drew on my background as a painter. Well, you went to Antioch. That was your undergraduate work? Yes, Antioch um, is well known for its, what would you call it, oddball uh, <laughs> way of looking at education, and particularly for a work-study program. I see. Uh, I'm looking here at a bio of you. Uh, it says when you were eight years old, you wanted to be a marine biologist. I still want to be a marine biologist. <laughs> About once a year I have the fantasy that I'll go back and take an undergraduate major in biology and start over. But, but marine biology, uh, you have to be out at sea a lot. I mean, it's uh, underwater, whatever. Right. I, have, I imagine myself with a snorkel and flipper fin swimming around the Red Sea. Well, it's Actually, my next biography, I hope, will be of Jacques Cousteau. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, that's fascinating. Has there, has there been a definitive work? Uh, by, by him. Uh, uh, by him, yeah. <laughs> and I, then, continuing with your uh, biography here, um, you were active in theater at Antioch. You were apprenticed as a puppeteer in Mexico City. Yeah, uh, at the time, I didn't like Antioch's jobs. They were mostly being sales girls in Los Angeles. And uh, so I managed to get myself a job I thought would be interesting and actually got a puppeteer in Mexico City to take me on as a trainee for about a year. Uh, I mean, you operated the puppets or you built them, designed them? Everything. It's a one-woman show when you have a puppet theater. And um, these were hand puppets. And so we would hide behind the proscenium stage and stick our hands in front with the puppets on them. He was a hunchback. Your, your instructor. Yeah, and I thought it was quite interesting that his way of expressing himself allowed him to be hidden. So when I started working on another artist with disabilities, it was quite interesting to me to sort of draw on my experience with the puppeteer. I wrote my PhD thesis on puppet theater in 19th century France, and then um, when I had my first job, which was at Brown University, where I was, of course, utterly unhappy because I wasn't doing art, I joined up with a bunch of people from the Rhode Island School of Design because I had all this experience as a puppeteer. And we were doing political stuff, largely. It was, um, this was in 71, 72. A good time for political stuff. And it was stuff. about just about the time that Nixon was going to be impeached. And we were out in the streets with the Bread and Puppet Theater, and then we built we, our own theater was called Elm Seed. And uh, we had huge puppets that we wore on our heads and hands. My, my crowning role was Nixon with both hands like this. And you adjust your mic cord here under your hands. Thanks. And, uh, and uh, protested the Vietnam War in the streets and manifested in front of various uh, military industrial complexes in the Boston area and got into as much trouble as we possibly could. And then when I came to Boulder, I opened my branch of Elm Seed, which I called Elm Seed West, and lured all my friends in Boulder into helping me write and, and put on plays. And we put on a number. We put on several at the uh, Boulder Public Library and on campus. And then... Um, anyway, all of this... I got uh, busy. <laughs> yeah, this... Uh, now, you go on here. You go, I mean, you, sp you sp talk, you taught at the Yale, Brown, Sarah Lawrence, Antioch, uh, Université de Paris, University of San Diego uh, Law School. Oh, yeah, in, in Paris, their Paris program. In their Paris program, yeah. and you are now an instructor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Yeah. You're, uh, a, you're a associate professor. Yeah. Uh, and this is your first book. Well, you can see why. <laughs> <I'm busy. laughs> now, you, you worked 10 years on this life of, a life of, to lose the track of life. This is, is a major your major opus and your first opus, I suppose. Yeah, I had no idea it was going to take me 10 years. But well, why? I mean, after all this background and uh, being the 
the anti-war movement, being here and being there and all over the world, why go to a 19th century French painting? In some ways it was serendipitous, and in other ways it actually fits in perfectly with my background. I um, teach 19th century French literature at the university. I've done my PhD thesis on puppet theater in 19th century France, and I had actually done very you know, serious scholarly articles on um, literary critical topics. And the University of Texas at Austin, where I had done my master's degree, owned an unpublished, or still owns an unpublished Flaubert manuscript, which I had done the first edition of. And what happened was that I took my typescript and the published first edition to Austin to give it to the manuscript library. They like to have the original manuscript, the typescripts, all the related materials, and the final product. And I said something like, what have you got for me next? And the manuscript librarian said, well, the most interesting thing we've acquired in your field is the toulouse lautrec family letters. Would you like to take a look at them? And I had just spent six months reading 19th century handwriting. And so I knew I would need a magnifying glass. And so I borrowed a huge magnifying glass. And they got out these sheets of letters. They had 1,200 pages. 1,200 pages? Of family letters. Not mostly by Lautrec, but some by him. Most of them were by his mother. And I sat down at a table. I felt just like Sherlock Holmes. I should have been wearing before and aft. <laughs> and um, I took my magnifying glass and started reading this sort of faded 19th century lady handwriting on this th paper, thin blue paper. And uh, old ink turns brown, and so it's sort of brown ink on blue paper. And in about 15 minutes, I realized that they were just a treasure. It was it was kind of like discovering, I don't know, a new, a new kind of bird or something. Nobody knew this stuff because these were not people who expected anyone to ever read these letters. They had a child who had health problems and they were writing back and forth because there weren't telephones and nobody did email. And the mail worked at the time and so you could write two or three letters a day and they would actually get there by the next day. And somebody in the family had saved all the letters and then had gotten poor and had sold them. And, and they somehow wound up in Texas. Well, I think the person who was selling the letters and who wanted the money had put them in the hands of a Parisian um, gallery, which also dealt in, in letters by famous people. And depending upon how important the reference was to the artist, to Louis Lautrec, the price of the letter varied. And so they could have been sold to hundreds of different people. But what really happened was that the gallery managed to get two different collectors competing for the letters. And as fate would have it, they were both Americans. And one of them had more money than the other, and so he sort of went for quality and bought all the most interesting letters. And the other guy was sort of younger and didn't have so much money, went for quantity and bought all the rest of the letters. And at the end, the if you will, the quantity guy, whose name is Carlton Lake, and who is well known because he wrote Life with Picasso, along with Francois Gillot in the 60s, and it was just made into the Merchant Ivory film. Or actually, they refused to let Merchant Ivory use their book as the film, which has now been called um, Living with Picasso something like or that. something like that. But at any rate, so here was this rather unusual situation. Uh, because of your art background and your background in French literature, of all places, Texas, you found this incredible amount of material that had never been published or publicized in any way. Exactly. And and this got you, you became fascinated with it. I just, it, it's sort of as if everything fell into place. A few minutes ago, I said I had the schizophrenic existence as an artist, somebody who wanted to write, but who was basically doing, um, you know, very scholarly research in French. And here I was using all my skills. You know, I knew how to read 19th century handwriting. I had, you know, years of graduate training. I could footnote with the best of them. But I also had all this training as a printmaker and as an artist. I know how to make a lithograph. I've made my own lithographs. I've ground lithographic stones. I know how they feel. And, uh, and I know just about everything about turn of the century French culture. So I knew the whole environment of Lautrec's life. And I actually didn't know his work very well at all. I, I didn't even know he was a dwarf when I started working on him. 
I vaguely recall my mother telling me. Well, wait, you had it. You had your PhD. You had your BA. You had a master's in philosophy. You had studied art. I had not, not, well, I studied doing art. But I don't have any art history back. I see, I see. And I, you know, I I knew his posters, I knew a number of his paintings, but I didn't know anything about his personal life. I just had never asked anybody. And and, uh, had you ever, had you seen the film with Jose Ferrari? I hadn't. I made a point of seeing it after I had largely finished the book. Oh, really? So you had, you were not affected by that film? No, I must have been too young when that film came out. I just didn't, I saw it later. Well, the the book, which is... uh, Rave reviews since its publication. It's published yeah, in lucky. the United States by Viking uh, in England uh, as well, a major publication. It's all. It's now out in French also. And it's out in French. Uh, and you know, and as someone who's, I, I studied art and I studied art history, and I I thought I knew everything about the Louvre track, but of course, all I knew was what I had been taught and what was available, the, the Hollywood version, and so on. And the things uh, that are in your book are really much more interesting. Deal extensively with his uh, relationship with his parents. Uh, he, uh, the, 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 I thought, well, the Comte de Toulouse Lautrec uh, was just kind of a title, but uh, in fact, he is a descendant of a long line of French aristocracy. Yes, the Toulouse Lautrecs were serious aristocrats. The original uh, Toulouse dynasty was a family dynasty that was almost as strong as the kings of France. The Comte de Toulouse owned about a third of southwestern France. So that during the time when France wasn't really a unified nation, the uh, Comte de Toulouse were approximately as powerful politically as the king of France was in the north, and then eventually lost, if you will, to the king and had to kind of settle down and become country nobles. And Lautrec, uh, Toulouse Lautrec is sort of a secondary branch of that family. And Lautrec's family was in some ways much calmer and less distinguished than their noble forebears. But they were old-time aristocracy. Um, Lautrec, I guess, couldn't help being a snob. It was, you know, he was yeah, born he was, to it. <laughs> yeah, born to snobbery. But, but uh, he as an individual and what he did seems to be totally out of line with the whole tradition of the nobility. I mean, we're talking about a family that goes back many centuries, and suddenly here's this rather uh, bizarre figure, this uh, man with very short legs, uh, patronizing the brothels of Paris and, uh, and painting the, the prostitutes, uh, dancers in Montmartre and things of this kind, uh, died at the age of 36 of alcoholism and syphilis. That's what I think. And, um, yeah, uh, as, uh, almost as if someone was uh, writing the decline and fall of the French Empire in some way. Well, I suppose it's sort of a stereotype to say that he was déclassé, that he left his social class and sank to another social class. But it's substantially more complicated than that. Lautrec hated hypocrisy. And you could see how, if you were a little boy with a birth defect, and everyone was kind of being nice to you and really uh, wanted you to stay home and stay out of sight and uh, do nice drawings of the family members and, and maybe a few landscapes. How you would, you might even make a personal mission of doing exactly as you pleased, living exactly as you wanted, and refusing to let anybody lie in your presence. And the thing that Lautrec does, m- more than to really déclasse himself, is to show exactly what a lot of men of his social class were doing, which was going to brothels and uh, going to working class cabarets, sort of slumming. Uh, Most of the students in the art classes that he attended, which of course his parents paid for, were well-bred young men with artistic talent, men with enough money not to have to go to work. So that he uh, was almost scapegoated for telling the truth. And because he was very visible, because he walked with a limp and he was four feet 11 and he uh, became an alcoholic very early, 
He was easy to notice, and he was always the first to show off, to crack jokes, to be rowdy in public. To He liked to be a kind of a gang leader and get other people in trouble. But it wasn't exactly leaving a social class. What he was doing is saying, look, let me tell you what's really going on here. He loved, for example, taking all his young male cousins to bars and brothels and who knows what, and debauching them, as it, as it were. But he wasn't the first to do that. And his father, in fact, was apparently quite a womanizer, but preferred servant girls, and, you know, the uh, daughters of his farmers. And the, you know, who so, so that, <clears throat> but the period, uh, end of the 19th century, is a period of great uh, political unrest. Enormous. Uh, we have the commune, 1870-71, uh, tremendous destruction, uh, deaths of tens of thousands of people, following the Franco-Prussian War, uh, the uh, colonization of Africa. Uh, many, many things were happening. Was Toulouse effect involved in any of that? Was he affected by it? Everyone who lived in France, of course, during the Franco-Prussian War and the Paris Commune and the Dreyfus Affair and all of the major political upheavals going on within the country was affected by it. He was in a tight spot, you might say, because he spent most of his free time in Paris with a tightly knit group of intellectuals and artists, a lot of whom were very left-wing and Jewish. And uh, his family was uh, pro-military, uh, extremely Catholic, reactionary, royalist. His father had fervently hoped that the legitimate king of France, who was known as the Comte de Chambord, he was Henry V of France, would be returned to the throne. And in fact, Henri uh, was named after Henry V, the Comte de Chambeau. And kind of an optimistic note in his childhood was that he would then be named for the man who was going to become the king, which was his rightful place by divine right, of course. Because a century before, uh, the French Revolution had taken place, and uh, they mm -hmm. cut off the guillotine and claimed a good part of the aristocracy. Yeah, and Lautrec's family had survived, and a hundred years later, they were still quite hopeful that uh, that um, the kings would be returned to the throne. And so poor Lautrec was trapped between his royalist father, who in the middle of the Dreyfus affair was anti-Dreyfus and pro-military and Catholic church, and all of his pro-Dreyfus uh, left-wing intellectual and artist Jewish friends, friends. And, and Jewish friends. And what he did, I have no idea what he really thought, was to be officially neutral and simply to refuse to state an opinion on that particular matter. But he was certainly raised in a family that was, well, that was anti-Semitic kind of naturally. They didn't even think about it. It never occurred to them to not be anti-Semitic. And I think they probably were not at all pleased with uh, Lautrec's choices and friends. They didn't like the uh, Jewish intellectuals, and they didn't like the prostitutes, and they didn't like the cabaret girls, and they didn't like... Um, the people he met in bars, and he, you know, he hung out with jockeys and all kinds of and clowns. He loved circus figures. The, the interesting thing to me is that in this period of tremendous stress, in which his family uh, and his friends were really at odds, uh, that when he depicted this reality as he saw it, which was offensive, of course, to his class, mm -hmm. uh, he did it in such a uh, creative, artistic manner, in his color, in his line, in his design, that his works uh, today, a hundred years later, essentially, uh, are uh, evoke the period. I mean, when we think of France at the fin de siècle, at the, at the end of the 19th century, essentially we tend to see the images through Toulouse Lautrec paintings. Yeah, almost every dorm room in the country has Toulouse Lautrec posters on the walls. I guess that a sign of genius is really having your own style that's so characteristic and so easy to identify that it does become a trademark of something. And because he was a poster maker, in part, I mean, he liked showing off, so the poster is the natural art form for him. And of course, that offended his family, who couldn't consider a poster serious art, you know, portrait maybe. And to see the name mm. of this... Oh, yeah, and of course, to put Family of Kings displayed uh, on the streets of Paris, pasted on the walls with illustrations of known prostitutes or mm -hmm. performers in cabarets. 
much of them, especially Galt. Oh, they were very offended by all of this. And I think he liked offending them. I think a lot of what he did was intentional, thumbing his nose at his parents' attempt to control him and restrain him. But um, the way he did his work, which in some ways is much like drawing with a, with a brush, that a lot of his work feels more as if it's drawn with oil paint than it is actually filled in and finished and painted. It's a distinct it was, oriental feel to it. Well, Japanese. he was very influenced by Japanese art, as was a lot of the um, okay. whole period. You know, every, everybody from the Impressionists to the end of the century was very interested in, in Japanese and the import, so imported Japanese art. You, 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 in fact, spent 10 years becoming an art historian. I had to learn a lot. It's true. It's, um, I'm sure I have huge gaps, but I've learned a lot about this particular period. In, um, the, in the book, uh, which I find to be a very, very interesting book, and I wish that when I was an art student back in the 40s, really, really, really my age, that uh, I had such a book to deal with. They're fascinating. Uh, well, of course, there's his artwork, and there's a very nice section of, of colored plates uh, that uh, I think we can see here. Uh, some of them, just page after page, I think there are 50 color plates, something like that. I forget, something yeah, like that. Yeah, it just yeah. goes on and on. But in addition to that, uh, there are a lot of fascinating things. The cover photograph, for example, is a trick photo mm -hmm. of Toulouse of Trek painting himself, done by a friend of his. Mm -hmm. And I, I found a lot of other very fascinating uh, photographs in the book uh, of uh, life in, in France uh, as it was. And, and, you know, he certainly was thumbing his nose. Uh, at the propriety, at conservatism, at, at all these things. Uh, uh, it's interesting to hear you speak about your own experiences as a puppeteer, uh, anti-war, mm -hmm. anti-Vietnam War thing. Uh, was there a kind of a personal thing between you and Toulouse Lautrec? I mean, I certainly got very fond of him, and I occasionally wonder what he would have been like if he had been, you know, 20 years old today. And I, I imagine he would have been a punk with tattoos and, and spiky, funny colored hair and interesting body piercing <laughs> because he was a brat. You know, he liked causing trouble. He wanted to be with it. He wanted to be modern. He wanted to do all the sort of most avant-garde uh, things in terms of art. For example, photography was only really invented in the 1830s. And so posing for a trick photograph and having his friend figure out how to do it would be just the kind of thing he did. And of course for a dwarf to like to be photographed fits in with his showing off. You know, the, the you're going to look at me anyway, so I might as well leap in front of the camera yeah. mode. And um, an interesting thing about this photograph, the reason I chose it for the um, cover is that many of his works, not just the photographs, but the works he paints, have what I call a sight gag in them. And there's one in this photograph. First of all, of course, Toulouse-Lautrec, the artist, is painting Toulouse-Lautrec, the model. But then the sight gag gets further complicated when you look at the canvas, because Toulouse-Lautrec, the artist, is not painting the model. If you were painting the model, there would be a, a full face on this canvas. What it has is a profile. So what Toulouse Lautrec, the artist, has painted on the canvas is a caricature of his own profile. And again, he's making fun of himself because the profile he's painted is substantially uglier and more uh, deformed, if you will, yeah. than his own profile. Well, one of the things that you get into in the book that has been remarked on by several reviewers is his uh, sexual aspect. I know that's what everybody always knows about Lautrec, and people always say, well, have you got any photographs that, <clears throat> et cetera. And when I fell into this, because I didn't really have any investment in who Lautrec was, I, I, I knew so little about him that I didn't have any preconceptions, I decided that I would, you know, just do the facts, man. <laughs> and so I only included in the book things that I could document, and we have absolutely no written documentation of Lautrec's uh, exact sexual habits. Uh, or dimensions. Or dimensions. So I did early, I think about page three, print a nude photograph of Lautrec. Uh, and 
uh, my observation of this photograph. It's, it's this one right here. Can we come into this photograph? Um, I think it's uh, not very... Uh, well, I, what I would say is that if he were extremely and exceptionally well endowed, it would, it would show. <laughs> <laughs> so my guess is that one of the endocrinologists whom I consulted yeah. on uh, Lautrec's um, sexual reputation probably was right. What he said is that... Um, what, you consulted an endocrinologist? I consulted people to answer every question that I had because I figured if I were writing a biography, I wanted to answer all the questions that I would ask if I were reading the biography. And so, of course, this was an important question. And so I had lots of informants and, uh, and had actually two endocrinologists who talked to me about the kinds of things that happen when someone has a um, genetic growth um, problem. And Lautrec had been described... You mean, you mean his height as a genetic growth problem? Well, he had, yeah. He, well, first of all, he had this hereditary malady that kept him from growing normally. But secondly, he was said to have suffered from something called macrogenitalism. And it turns out that macrogenitalism is a real malady but it occurs only in prepubescent boys. It does not exist in adults. Therefore, he couldn't have had it. Or if he had it, it was long before anybody ever saw him without his clothes on to, to so, comment so on his endowment. Yeah. And so my endocrinologist thought that probably what Lautrec had was short leg. I hope so. Too. I want to thank you for appearing. And uh, it's a very, very interesting book. And uh, I'm learning a lot from reading it. Thanks. That's Robert Cohen. For Penn, we've been interviewing Julia Fry, the author of Toulouse La Trek, A Life, uh, published in the United States by Viking. I want to thank you all very much. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, and I hope that you buy the book and enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks.